All right, tonight we're going to be uh, in uh, Judges chapter 16. So if you'll take your Bibles and go to the book of Judges chapter 16. We're going to be looking at the uh, last chapter regarding the life of Samson. Uh, Samson, again, was the last of the 12 judges that are mentioned in the book of Judges. Uh, Gideon gets a few more verses than Samson does, but otherwise Samson has more chapters than any of the other judges, and he's probably uh, the most well-known of the 12 um, that are mentioned here in the book of Judges. And he's well-known for his physical strength, and he's also well-known, unfortunately, for his moral weakness. And uh, as I said last week, and as we've talked about Samson over the past couple of weeks, he is a very complicated man. He is complicated because he is a man that God uses despite the fact that, that Samson is given to moral weakness, particularly women, and not just any women. He's attracted to Philistine women who are pagan women. They don't love God. They don't love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's attracted to them. He has relationships with them. We see tonight in chapter 16, he even sleeps with a prostitute. So he's, he's a very weak man morally, though he is physically strong. And because of that, we refer to him as a very complicated man. And it is sometimes difficult to understand how God would use a guy like this. So I'll have more to say about it, but let's first pray. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Samson and this closing chapter in chapter 16 about his life. Lord, we come to you thankful for your grace, thankful, Lord, for your love, for your son, Jesus. And uh, Lord, as we gather here in Jesus' name, as we worship in Jesus' name, as we read your word in Jesus' name, we just thank you that you meet us here, that you minister to us. And Lord, we pray that you would just refresh us. And I just think particularly of those who are just weary tonight. And I pray, God, would you refresh the weary and would you just reveal yourself in a very powerful and strong way for all of us, Lord. We need you, and we thank you that you meet us here time and again. We love you, and we praise you for your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and everybody said amen. Again, the life of Samson, um, he was the only of the judges who was uh, living under a Nazarite vow. And this is important. I just want to repeat this. I know those of you who have been here the last couple of weeks, you're familiar with what a Nazarite vow is, but it comes into play, into focus in this last chapter of his life. So I just want to remind us that a Nazarite is one who took a vow of both separation and dedication. One who said that, you're, you're, that for the duration of the vow, your life was separate from the world and you were dedicated to God. In Samson's case, his vow was for a lifetime. But normally, some Somebody could take a vow for a, any particular amount of time. Samson, however, was called by God to lead a life that was separated from the world and dedicated to God for his entire life. And in Numbers chapter 6, it outlines three particular requirements for those who are living under a Nazarite vow. Number one, no eating or drinking anything from the grapevine that includes wine, grapes, grape juice, raisins. Number two, no cutting of the hair because that was a sign that you were under the covenant of the Nazarite vow, which means that Samson was never to cut his hair. And number three, no contact with any dead body. That's uh, including human bodies or animal carcasses. And as I mentioned, as we've been looking over the last couple of weeks, Samson was a very compromising man that he always kind of danced on the edge and he always was um, always pushing the envelope, all these different phrases that we would use for somebody playing with fire, however other many uh, little expressions you want to use. This is the life of Samson. And he was this kind of a guy. That's what makes him so complicated. And yet clearly God called him. He is the only one and all of the judges uh, that the Bible says that God had spoken about his life before he was even conceived that he's the only one of the 12 in the book of Judges, that God sent the angel of the Lord, which is a Christophany, it's appearance of Jesus, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, to the mother of Samson to announce to her that she was going to conceive a child. She had been barren and unable to conceive. And so obviously God's hand was on this guy's life, so much so that the angel of the Lord appears to Samson's mother and to announce that she's even going to conceive him. 
So there's no question that God's hand was on this guy's life, even though he stumbles and sins in many grievous ways. And in Hebrews 11, he gets mentioned in the Hebrew Hall of Faith as a man who did valiant things for God. So how do we reconcile this? This is troubling. And I want to particularly just focus on this for just a little bit because there are some of you that have encountered in your lifetime spiritual men and women who were godly, who loved Jesus, who were followers of the Lord, who were influential in your life, and sadly, some of them had moral failures. And some of them walked away from faith. Some of them perhaps turned out to be false teachers or, or whatever. And it is easy for people to become disillusioned with God because of a leader who was a failure in different ways, morally, spiritually. And so it's important sometimes we need to separate the, um, the, we need to separate the faithful deeds that someone might have done for the Lord from the unfaithful lives that they lived. And that's hard sometimes. Sometimes those things are connected. And unfortunately, if you don't learn to separate it, if you had someone in your life who was a godly influence who ended up having some kind of moral failure or walked away from the church or whatever, if you don't learn to separate faithful deeds from an unfaithful life, then you are liable to call into question your own salvation, your own walk with the Lord. Because you're going to want to dismiss, well, if this person was such a godly influence in my life, and now they've had these moral failures or they've walked away from the Lord, what does that mean about the security of my own salvation? You have to separate their faithful deeds, because obviously at one point in their life they were doing faithful things for God, it was influential for you, from their unfaithful lives that they lived. And so it's important for us to separate that so that, you know, our own security and our salvation or our own, you know, love for Jesus or our own involvement in the church does not become threatened because of someone else's failure in your life. People will fail you. People are frail and sinful. And so unfortunately, that is the case sometimes. Uh, and, and, yet, and yet God still uses frail people for his glory. Uh, I, nobody's justifying Samson's life. Nobody's making excuses for his sin. I'm certainly not, and I don't want that to come across in the course of this teaching. Um, nobody's condoning his behavior. It is sinful. It's no doubt grievous to God. And yet God still used him. Now, he's going to come to a very sad ending here, his life. Very embarrassing um, conclusion to his life that we're going to see here in chapter 16. And so, there's, there's a price that he does pay for his uh, moral weakness and for his sinful life. There is a price that he pays. But God in his sovereignty still uses frail people, ordinary people, for his extraordinary work. That's just, that's just how he is. You know, because there's only one perfect person who ever walked the face of the earth, that's Jesus. And so everybody else that God uses in the course of human history to accomplish his eternal sovereign things will be frail, fallen, sinful people. Again, no one is condoning that, it's just, it's just a matter of fact when you look in the Bible the people that God used. So, um, that's, that's Samson here. Uh, his unfaithful life does not negate the faithful things that he did for God, but it does preclude him from being an example of a life well lived. And so, we're going to see some of the things that we can learn from his compromised life. And, and by the way, when Paul was writing his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and Paul was recalling his own Jewish history, he was talking about the faithlessness of the Israelites, particularly in their years of the wilderness wandering between Egypt and, and getting to the promised land. 
and how they suffered and died because of their unfaithfulness. An entire generation dies in the wilderness, only their children go into the promised land. Paul will write in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, he says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, as examples, and they were written for our admonition. And he goes on to write there in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So some of the things you read in the Bible are written as examples to us for our admonition. Clearly, Samson's life is one of those examples. His life is written to us that we might be admonished. Hey, wake up to some of the things that he fell into, some of the things that caused him to really sin before God. So, so again, complicated man, but God used him. Let's take a look here at chapter 16 together. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. So there you go. At the beginning of chapter 16, here we are. He, he sees a prostitute. He goes down to Gaza. Now Gaza was the capital city of the Philistine territory at this particular time. He's going into enemy territory to sleep with a prostitute. I mean, none of this makes sense on any level. It's like you're going to, the Philistines are your enemies. So you're going to their capital city, you're hanging out with them, you're fraternizing with the enemy, and you're finding a prostitute there. But there he is, there he goes. Now Gaza was a particular city at this time, but Gaza is now the name of a region that hugs the Mediterranean coast, and it is today where about a half a million Palestinians live. But I wanna say again, the modern day Palestinians are not the descendants of the Philistines. The Philistines were seafaring people that end up, you know, being wiped off of history. So they're not the same, but the Palestinians of today do occupy the same, the similar region and territory uh, that the ancient Philistines did that we're reading about here in our story. So here Samson goes down to Gaza, saw a harlot there and went into her. And it says, when the Gazites were told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. And they were quiet all night saying, in the morning when it's daylight, we will kill him. Of course, because he's in Philistine territory. Verse three, and Samson lay low till midnight. And then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So this, so this is this guy, right? So he's like, I'm going to go down into enemy territory to their capital city. I'm going to find me a prostitute. That's what he does. And then he sleeps with her. And then around midnight, he's like, under the cover of darkness, I better, I better get back home. So then he, and then he leaves the prostitute. Oh, but the gates are locked. Oh, because he's in the capital city of the Philistines. They've locked them in. Well, no problem for Samson because he's got this supernatural strength. He doesn't have a key to unlock the door. So what does he do? He just does what I do when I come to a locked door. <laughs> I rip it off its hinges. That's what he does. He rips it off its hinges, bar and all. And, and uh, historians believe that the fortified gates of a city would have weighed anywhere from 800 to 1,000 pounds. This is what this guy just pulls off, throws it over his shoulder, heads up the hill that faces Hebron. So this is this dude, very, very physically strong. But again, the tragic story of his life is morally weak. Now, as I mentioned, and we're going to see it spelled out here in a minute, it appears that Samson was not this ripped, really shredded, jacked up guy. He's probably a very ordinary looking guy because they don't understand the secret of his strength. If you're looking at a guy who's like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're not going to wonder, what's the secret of your strength? It's going to be pretty obvious. At least Arnold in his earlier days. But anyway, uh, uh, like I can even complain or compare. But, but that's the deal here. He's probably a very average looking guy. Because why? The strength that he has is not because he's well built. I mean, he might have been, but it's probably not the case. His strength is from the Lord. And he forgets this. Now, verse 4, he's done with the prostitute in Gaza. We come to a second woman. And this is the one that he's most known to have had a relationship with. 
we're introduced here in verse 4 to Delilah. So here we go, verse 4. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now the valley of Sorek is about 30 miles northeast of Gaza. So he's moved on. This is a separate woman altogether. It is believed, though it doesn't specifically say, that she is a Philistine herself because she has a close connection with the Philistine leaders. And so you're not going to have a close connection with the Philistine leaders if you're a Jew. So it's more than likely she is a Philistine. Again, this is a problem. Verse 5, And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the proof text why it's believed that Samson was just looking like an ordinary man. Because they're asking, find out where his great strength lies. He may not have been all that muscular. And it says, and every one of us, among the Philistine lords, the leaders, every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, Bible scholars believe that the number of the lords of the Philistines, the number of the leaders, were five. So we don't know for sure, but let's just say five. And each of them is going to give her 1,100 pieces of, of silver, which is, which is a shekel. And so when you convert the weight and the dollar value, uh, 1,100 shekels uh, is about 28 pounds of, of silver. And you multiply this times five, so now it represents about 140 pounds of silver. So I just looked up today to see, okay, what was silver trading at so we can get like a modern equivalent. So silver today is, is right around $25 an ounce. So this is the equivalent in modern dollars of $56,000. So for $56,000, you're gonna sell out this guy. All right, I mean, it's not, it's not like, you know, the price of a Happy Meal, $56,000, $56,000. But it's not like it's a million dollars, it's $56,000. And so this is what they offer her. We'll give you $56,000 if you find out the secret of his strength and then tell us. And so Delilah said to Samson, verse 6, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, well, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now, this is a lie. This is a lie. This is lie number one. He's going to lie three times. So he's <laughs> like, there's nothing good about this scene at all. You've just finished sleeping with a prostitute. Now you move into a Philistine girl and you're going to start to lie to her and sleep with her. Okay. So, he tells her this. So, verse 8, so the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now, it doesn't tell us how did she bind him. Was he just like a willing partner? You know, is this like a little, you know, funny stuff in the bedroom? I don't know. Just go, <laughs> Let me tie you up. All right, are you into that? Okay, let's tie, tie me up, babe. You know, so I, it doesn't say he was asleep. Look, don't, don't, look, some of you are like, did he just say that? Come on. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know how she tied him up. He had to be willing here. If he's asleep, is she sliding it under? I don't know. It doesn't say here, but she ties him up. It's, it's probably an indication that, uh, you know, he, that he's into this. I don't know. It's just 50 shades of Gaza. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> but anyway, but verse 9 says, now, now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he broke the, the, bow, the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secrets of his strength was not known. So I was like, okay. So now, if this happens once to you, are you going to learn? <laughs> not, not Samson. Next verse. Verse 10, then Delilah said to Samson, look, you have mocked me. You've mocked me and told me lies. Now, please tell me what you may be bound with. He's like, you're really into this tied me up thing, aren't you? Okay. So he said to her, well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. It's lie number two. This isn't true. 
Therefore, Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. All right. So, second ruse. All right. Still, verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, Until now. <laughs> until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me. Tell me what you may be bound with. It's like, man, this chick's really into this binding thing. All right. And he said to her, if you weave seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. <laughs> what? Yeah, if you make a rug out of my hair, <laughs> just hook me up to a loom, babe, and start weaving, weaving my hair. Now, it's never been cut, so it's, it's got to be pretty long. So you just got to pull it out of the man bun here and put it into the, put it into the loom. And so it says there, so she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he, but he awoke from his sleep. Now this time it does say he was asleep when she did this. And pulled, he pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. So it's still attached to his head. <laughs> Look, there is a serious problem when for the third time, you, you have been saying something that is a lie, but on the third time, you, you've got a daggone loom stuck to your head, and he still, he still doesn't get it. He still doesn't get it. Like, she, she's up to something here. He still doesn't get it. So, she said to him, verse 15, how can you say I love you? How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? How can you say this? How can you say that this is the third time I've asked you and you have not? Now look, the reality is her heart's not with him. It's her heart that's not with him. She's ready to trade this boy in for $56,000. But she, that's what she asks. She goes, you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass, look at this, when she pestered him daily. Every man, look at me right here. Look here. Look right here. Do not look to the left or the right. Look right here. She pestered him daily with her words and pressed him, look, so that his soul was vexed to death. I wanted to die. Now, have you noticed this? This isn't the first time. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He gets hooked up with women who wear him down like this. I mean, they're just like pleading and crying. And, and so, so he is just, I'm ready to die. And so verse 17, that he told her all his heart and he said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head. Now listen, he's going to tell her the truth now. No razor has ever come upon my head for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Okay, now he just told her, you know, look, this is part of his vow, the Nazarite vow, you don't cut your hair. Now, the, the secret of his strength was not in his hair itself. It's what his hair symbolized. His hair symbolized that he was under a Nazarite vow because he was separate from the world and dedicated to God. The cutting of his hair, which is what number six tells us, was the ending of the Nazarite vow, which then indicates that you are no longer, at least purposefully, separated from the world and dedicated to God. That's why his strength is going to leave him. It's not because there's magic in his hair. It is because what his hair symbolized, that he was dedicated unto God, separated from the world. You cut my hair, the vow's off. And he tells her. This is the secret of my strength. If you cut my hair, I will lose my strength. And so when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. This is, this is what it's about for her. And then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment him, to tease him, and his, and his strength left him. So this is, this is a very tragic story here. 
By the way, I don't know if you know that Samson wrote a song uh, about Delilah. <laughs> it goes like this. It goes like this. Yes. Hey there, Delilah, what's it like in Gaza City? I'm a thousand miles away, but girl, you are, yes, so pretty. Yes, you do, even though I know you're not a Jew. Oh, what you do to me. Oh, you sneaky Philistine. Oh, my love for you is rare. Oh, you've cut off all my hair. You've cut off all my hair. Hair. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's, a, that's a, no, that's just terrible. That, anyway, so uh, so Samson uh, must have written that song. I heard it somewhere. But anyway, now it gets even more tragic. Here, take a look, verse twenty. And she said, "The Philistines are upon you, Samson." And so he awoke from his sleep and said, "I will go out as before." He's thinking, "I'm going to have the same strength. I will go out as before at other times." And shake myself free, but he did not. This is one of the most tragic verses in all the Bible. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again. After it had been shaven, I want to share with you before we read the rest of the chapter. If we have time, I want to share with you five lessons from Samson's compromised life. Five lessons from Samson's compromised life. The first is this: number one, little compromises lead to a big fall. Guard the little things. When you look at Samson's life and the decline of his life. It started with the little compromises. You remember when he was on the road to Timnah, and he started. He went off the road down into the vineyards. He had no business being in the vineyards. Now, technically, he hadn't violated the Nazarite vow unless he ate of the grapes or anything related to the to the grape vine. But why is he even there? Why did he leave the road to go into the vineyard? It's a slight compromise, but that's where it all begins. It's in the vineyard then that the lion attacks him. He kills the lion. Now he's around a dead body. Now he's compromising again. And if you remember the story on his way back, he visits the carcass of the lion that he had killed to find that bees had made a hive producing honey. And he reaches within the carcass of the lion to pull out something sweet from something that is dead. We talked about that last week. It's a picture of a lot of, of things. But what it speaks of primarily is one little compromise after another, one little compromise after a love, a, a, another. People don't just suddenly fall big. It starts with little incremental things that give place to bigger things because when you think to yourself, this little thing didn't really get me in trouble and that little thing didn't get me into trouble, so it must be okay until you continue down that path and it ends up being a big thing that is very costly. So little compromises lead to a big fall. Guard the little things. Uh, I shared a couple of weeks ago about the, the tragic story of uh, Columbia, the Columbia air disaster, but... Um, there's another one that illustrates this whole thing about how something little can bring about great destruction. It was December the 29th, 1972. It was Eastern Airlines Flight 401. They were on their way from JFK to Miami International Airport. They crashed in the Everglades. 101 people died, including the captain. And why? Because of a $5 light bulb. Now, here's the story. On its approach to Miami International Airport, the pilot dropped the landing gear, but a little green light that was supposed to illuminate showing the landing gear was in locked position did not light up. So they weren't sure if the wheels were down. The crash occurred as a result of the entire flight crew becoming preoccupied with the landing uh, indicator light and wondering why it wasn't working and failing to notice, because they were preoccupied at the light bulb, 
They failed to notice that the autopilot had inadvertently been disconnected, and as a result, while the flight crew was distracted with the little indicator light, and because the flight was at night, and the Everglades are dark, no one could visibly notice the gradual drop in altitude, and the aircraft crashed in the Florida Everglades. 101 people died, including the captain, and it was later determined that the landing gear was in fact down, just the $5 light bulb was burned out. Great destruction over a little tiny thing. That's what compromise can do to us. Number two, compromise eventually makes us oblivious to the obvious. When you look at those three times that Samson lied to Delilah, you have to ask yourself at what point and why didn't he <clears throat> recognize something was up? You know, she, and she, she's asking him all these different times, what's the secret of your strength? What's the secret of your strength? And then he lies, he lies, he lies until he finally tells her the truth. He just became oblivious to the obvious because when you're in a constant state of compromise, you're not tuned in, you're not discerning, you're not wise about stuff. You become blind to stuff. You become oblivious to things. This is what happened to him. Number three, compromise depletes us of God's strength. This is what happened here in Samson's life. Uh, it tells us in verse 19 that his strength left him. But what is worse is in verse 20, it says the Lord had left him. And the reason his strength left him was because the Lord left him. The Lord was his strength. When his relationship with the Lord suffered, his strength was depleted with it. You know, you see in the Bible at different times how people properly understood the connection between their relationship with the Lord and the strength of their lives. Moses said in Exodus 15 verse 2, the Lord is my strength and my song. David said in Psalm 28 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. Habakkuk said in chapter 3 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. The sons of Korah in Psalm 46, 1 said, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in times of trouble. If your walk with the Lord suffers, your strength will be depleted. This is what happened with Samson. Number four, compromise blinds us and binds us. Now this is kind of a play on words that I've written there because of what happened to him when he was captured. They poked out his eyes, he became blind, and they put his feet in fetters. And he became this prisoner. And he was both blind and he was now bound here. We become blind to what is right and wrong. And we become bound to what controls us. He was, he was a bound man. He was blinded by compromise. And he was bound up by sin. Blinded by compromise and bound up by sin. And number five, compromise exposes our biggest battle, the one within. Unlike all the other judges, Samson never fought a war with an army. Othniel did, Ehud did, Deborah did, Gideon did, Jephthah did. Samson never gathered the army of Israel and went out to war like all the other judges. Perhaps that's because Samson's biggest battle was not really with the Philistines. His biggest battle was from within. Samson's biggest battle was Samson. So is yours. Your biggest battle is not people that you don't get along with, somebody who's you know, mistreating you or maligning your name or, I mean, those are distractions. And yes, the enemy's at work too. There's no question about it. There are three things that work in concert against us at all times. The world, people out there, and the love of the world and the things of the world. The enemy, number two, and our own flesh. And sometimes we're so focused on the temptations of the world and what the enemy is up to that we lose sight of the fact that sometimes our biggest battle is right here. And that we need to make sure our hearts are right with the Lord at all times because we become the biggest, the biggest battle ourselves. So those five things I think are important for us to take away from his life. 
Um, I got like three minutes, but let's, let's breeze through. This is just a tragic epilogue to his life, so we can, we can read this pretty quickly here. Verse 23. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. Now Dagon was a, a primary god of the Philistines. He was a very weird looking god. It, it, they, they made him with the body of a fish, the head of a man, and the hands of a man. So that was their god, Dagon. It was, it was very weird looking, which is why you'd look at it and go, Dagon. All right, so <laughs> there you go. Body of a fish, head and hands of a man. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. No, he hasn't. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened, when their hearts were merry, that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. And so they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women, all the Philistine women and men. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Isn't this humiliating? This is, this is the epilogue of his life. He's blind, he's weak, he has to have a, a little boy lead him around. What's happened to him? It's a very sad end of his life. Well, God does one last merciful thing. Verse 28, then Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. And so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him, that is, took his body, brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. And he had judged Israel 20 years. That's his story. Very complicated man that God used. And even his last request, Lord, use me. But he didn't finish well, folks. You know, it really doesn't matter what kind of a start you got in following the Lord. Some of you got an early start in life. Some of you have gotten a later start. Some of you are still trying to figure out if you want to start with the Lord. But what really matters is how well you finish. Finish well. Run the race with perseverance. Compromise was a word that defined Samson's life, but it doesn't have to define ours. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Walk in his grace. Be quick to repent. No compromise. Amen? Amen. Father, this is our prayer. And we thank you, Lord, that you've preserved the record of Samson's life because it is a reminder to us, an admonition in many ways. A very complicated, duplicitous man. And it's a picture often of our own lives, Lord. We struggle sometimes, the flesh wanting to do what we want, the spirit wanting to do what you want, having this battle within us. Lord, may we fight the good fight of the faith and may we finish well. May we be strong in the Lord and in your mighty power. May we not give in to little compromises, Lord. Help us, we pray, Lord, because we're weak. We are needy people. And we ask you to strengthen our hearts that we might run the race with perseverance so that on that day we stand before you, we might hear you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your salvation. It's a long journey, Lord.
and often a journey that is littered with temptation and struggles and sins and failures. Restoration, getting back up, Lord, having you dust us off and restore us. And we're thankful, Lord. Help us, we pray, to learn from Samson's life. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.